Good morning, friends. Welcome again to Sabbath School Study Hour, coming to you from the Granite Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church near Sacramento, California. I'd like to warmly welcome our online members and also those joining us on the various television networks tuning in to study God's Word. Also to the members and the visitors right here in Granite Bay, very warm welcome to you. Always good to see you week after week coming early for Sabbath School to study God's Word. Now, we've been studying through our lesson courtly, dealing with the first and the second books of Peter. It's entitled, Feed My Sheep. And today, we're on lesson number eight. Our lesson is called, Jesus in the Writings of Peter. But before we get to our lesson, we like to let those viewing uh, know about a free offer that we have. It is a book entitled, The High Cost of the Cross, written by Joe Cruz. For those watching in North America, if you'd like to receive a free copy of the book, the High Cost of the Cross, give us a call on our resource phone number. That number is 866-788-3966 and ask for offer. I believe 156 is the offer. And we'll be happy to send this to anybody here in North America. If you're outside of North America, just go to the Amazing Facts website, amazingfacts.org, and you can actually read the book for free right there online. Well, we have a special treat this morning. We have the... Uh, Sullivan Correll from the Auburn Adventist Academy in Washington that is here with us this morning, and they're going to be bringing us two musical numbers for our Sabbath school today. Welcome and thank you.
Thank you, Pastor Ross, and thank you to the Auburn Academy. That was beautiful, wasn't it? Amen. Amen. We sure appreciate that. And uh, I promised, Pastor Ross and I were in Houston, Texas last week, as of the time we're recording this, and there were about 8,000 people that came to an evangelism uh, celebration festival there, and a lot of them say they watch Sabbath school. I said, next time we're on, we'll wave at you. So just let them know that we're watching with you and we're, we're glad you're tuning in because of the time difference some of them can watch uh, after they get home from church. And so uh, it's good to know that we've got uh, the extended class. I want to welcome everybody both here at Granite Bay and abroad. We are continuing our study on the first and second books of Peter. And uh, you know, it's a blessing for me to be able to do this because I learn as I prepare for you. I say, oh, I didn't know that. I'm learning things all the time. And so uh, we're learning together, and uh, hopefully today I won't be the only one that's learning. I'll be able to share something with you. But um, we're in Lesson 8 dealing with Jesus in the writings of Peter. Now, you might say this is kind of up my alley because I am always looking for Jesus in all the stories of the Bible. As some of you know, I wrote a book and did a series a few years ago called Jesus in All the Bible. And so when I'm studying about Jesus in the writings of Peter, um, just what I love to do. Um, you know, you can see analogies of Christ throughout the, um, the Old Testament. You know, Joseph is a type of Christ. And uh, David, we're learning, is a type of Christ, as is Moses and Gideon and Psalm, Samson. And you can find... Uh, the typology of Jesus in many of the Old Testament stories, but you can even find typology of Jesus in the New Testament stories. For example, um, Jesus was falsely tried. He was brought outside the city. They took away his clothes. They had the clothes there at the foot of the cross. He was uh, executed after three and a half years of ministry, and he prayed for the forgiveness of those that killed him. Three and a half years later, Stephen is falsely tried after making a defense. He's taken outside the city. They lay the clothes down at the feet of Saul. Stephen prays for the forgiveness of those that are about to kill him. And so even in Stephen, what he does three and a half years after Christ, you see types. So there's even these types of Christ within the New Testament. John the Baptist is one, and so forth. But um, Peter, is he's not really speaking of typology in his lesson. He's coming right out and talking about Jesus. We have a memory verse, and the memory verse, I hope you'll read it with me. It's in the New King James Version. It's 1 Peter 2.24. Give you a minute to find that so I can hear you all sort of echo it with me. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. Are you ready? who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Okay. Now we've learned in some previous lessons that Peter is talking to believers that are facing a great deal of persecution and struggles and suffering. And... Um, in the midst of that all, he holds up Jesus, who is an example for them. Um, matter of fact, from the beginning to the end of Peter's writings, his focus is Jesus, as I'll try and prove in a minute. Um, you ever met somebody that became infatuated with some herbal remedy, and sometimes they're connected with, you know, it's uh, multi-level marketing, I'm not saying there's no good herbal remedies out there, so don't come after me after the program. You'll be wasting your time. <laughs> I know that there are some good herbal remedies out there, but I've met some people, and when they get into a multi-level marketing scheme, they'll tell you that that herbal remedy heals everything. And, you know, I've, I've, you know they say, oh, yeah, it's, it's good for this, and it's good for that, and it's good for this, and it's good for that. I was looking online and, and just to see if it's still true, and uh, I saw this thing about Roman coriander, black caraway seed, or black cumin. These tiny black seeds have been called the remedy for everything but death. And researchers are still unraveling more uses for them and benefits as we speak. Heart health, type 2 diabetes, epilepsy, asthma, cold and flu, 
muscle cramps, spasms, radiation control, toothache, psoriasis. It'll pre treat and prevent several types of cancer and grow hair on a cue ball. No, I threw that in. But I've run into them before that they say that. It's the all in all. Well, that is not true of herbs. I have friends who used to believe that about garlic, too. And, uh, and they, they lived by it. You know, you just, you didn't want to get too close when you were visiting with them. But um, anyone met that person? <laughs> but, you know, when you're, when you're born again Christian and you really become aware of Jesus in the Bible, you have Jesus sightings everywhere. You know, so people that loved Elvis had Elvis sightings. They just missed them so much they managed to see him everywhere. <laughs> but when you fall in love with Jesus, you see Jesus all through the Bible. And um, Peter sees Christ. He is the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now in a moment, someone's going to look up for me. <clears throat> uh, 2 Peter 2, no, 2 Peter 3, verse 18. And you'll have that, Hafti's, in just a minute. Uh, how does the Bible begin? Whose name begins the New Testament? Well, God's name begins the Old Testament. In the beginning, God. And who created the world? Jesus. All things that were made were made by Him. In the beginning was the Word. So when you read in the first verses of the Old Testament, in the beginning, God, you can say Jesus too, right? And then you start the New Testament. And it begins by saying... The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So his words are the beginning of the New Testament. How does the New Testament end? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So the New Testament begins and ends with Jesus. Now look at Peter's writings and see if you see a similar pattern here. 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's his introduction. Of course, a number of the apostles started that way. But look at how he ends. 1 Peter 5, 14. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Now, you know, I need to do a sermon on that one day while we're talking about our 27 <coughs> fundamentals. 28 fundamentals. Thank you. Uh, we need to make it 29, huh? We've heard sermons about, you know, baptism and communion and foot washing, but I have not heard this sermon about greeting each other with a kiss of love. The holy kiss. Anyway, I won't take that too far. And then he goes on to say, Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. How's the New Testament end? Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. How does Peter end his book? Christ Jesus. Amen. Go to 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Now we've looked at the first Peter. He starts and ends with Jesus. Go to 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can just tell that he's, he's in love with Jesus. Jesus is everything to him. Go ahead, Hafti, read the next passage. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. And of course, that's how he ends Second Peter, and that's chapter 3, verse 18. So it's safe to say that Peter was obsessed with Jesus. You know, that happens when you fall in love with something. Is it's just, you can't stop talking about it. And Peter was that way. Um, why was Peter obsessed with Jesus? Why was Jesus everything to Peter? What makes a person the focus of what you talk about? This isn't a hard one. Come on, guys. It's a four-letter word. Love. Love. Mark 16, 7. Jesus, when he rises from the dead, now Peter made a big mistake. He has betrayed, he has denied somebody that he really loved. He was scared, and he was tired, and he was confused, and, and he denied Jesus. Did Christ forsake him? When Jesus was being beaten and tried, and Peter, the third time he denied Jesus there in the courtyard, and, and he was swearing and cursing, he said, uh, I'm telling you, I don't know who he is. And then the rooster crowed for the second time. After Peter denied him three times, Jesus turned to look at him, and it broke his heart. It says he went out and he wept bitterly. Peter went through, I think, a, 
a genuine conversion at that time. So when Christ rises from the dead, and you read this in the book of Mark, by the way Mark is largely the gospel of Peter dictated to Mark, when Christ rises he tells the women, go tell his disciples and Peter. Why did Jesus specify? Why did the angels specify? Go tell the disciples. Why didn't he just say the disciples and wouldn't that have included Peter? Why did he also mention Peter specifically? He was specifically discouraged. It says they all forsook him and fled, but Peter did it with enthusiasm. He really denied him. And so he needed some encouragement. Now not only did, did Jesus, let's see, let me just, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to ask you. Who did Jesus appear to first when he rose from the dead? Mary Magdalene. Who did he appear to next? Disciples I'm hearing in the upper room? Maybe. All right, look, look, go to Luke 24 real quick. I'm going to show you something. This all fits in with what we're talking about Peter because I want you to know more about where he's coming from and why he loved Jesus so. And um, if you go to Luke chapter 24 and let me see here. Go to verse uh, 33. Now, on the road to Emmaus, what day of the week did this happen? It's a Sunday afternoon. They're walking down the road. Jesus appears to them. It's after he's appeared to Mary. Are you with me? Am I right so far? And Christ reveals himself to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And then they don't know who it is. They invite him in to eat. He eats with them. And while they're blessing the bread, he opens his hands. They see the scars. Whatever reason, he opens their eyes and they know him. Then he disappears. And they are so excited. Verse 33, I'm in Luke 24, 33. They rose up that very hour. It's dark. They've got to go back to Jerusalem, seven miles uphill. Tell the disciples he's alive. They rose that very hour. They returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven. And those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Now, who is Simon? Peter. Peter. Why are they saying that? Because somewhere between the resurrection when he saw Mary and the upper room and the road to Emmaus, he had a personal meeting with Peter. I, I believe, isn't that what's, what else do you read from this? He met with several people. Another verse says he met with the women. Remember, first he met with Mary Magdalene, but later the angels um, told the women he was alive. And then on their way to tell the men, he met with the women. And at some point during the day, he specifically, personally appeared, not only to Mary Magdalene, he appeared to Peter. And Peter said, I saw him, he's alive. They said, no, you didn't really see him. And the disciples come to the upper room, they go, yeah, he did appear to Peter. And so uh, Jesus personally appeared to Peter. Now after Jesus meets um, the disciples out fishing in John chapter 20, and they see some stranger on the shore with some coals on a fire, and and he, they haven't caught anything, and the stranger says, cast your net towards me on the right side of the ship. And they said, oh, you know, we fished all night. And so they cast their net on the right side of the ship, and it's full of fish, and then one of those fishermen suddenly realizes who that man is. Who is that? Peter. And so does he wait for the boat to calmly load up the fish and paddle to shore? It doesn't even wait for them to finish hauling in the catch, which is very hard for a fisherman. For a fisherman to love something more than fish, you really must love it. And so Peter even loved Jesus more than f a good catch. And so he, he tucked in his swimming gear and he dove in the water and he swam ashore. And then what does Jesus ask Peter after they eat together? Three times. He says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And how does Peter respond? He says, Lord, you know I love you. I love you. You know everything. You know I love you. You know my heart. You know I love you. And so Peter loved Jesus. And so the central core of what Peter talks about, and that was actually my introduction, was, uh, is that uh, Christ was in and all and everything. All right, uh, let's go to the section under where it says, Jesus, our sacrifice. And this was a theme in Peter's writings. Jesus, our sacrifice. 
Um, someone in a moment is going to read Acts 3, 6, okay? First Peter, I'll read, First Peter uh, 1, 18 and 19. Knowing this, that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, but uh, received by the tradition of your fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Why does Peter say you were not redeemed with gold or silver? Why even make that contrast? Did anybody believe they were redeemed with gold and silver? Well, that wasn't the indulgences. He said, yeah, that came later. But they, even in Christ's time, um, did they somehow think they got credit for giving? Did Jesus teach about when you give, if you want your reward, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't blow the trumpet before you like the hypocrites do, but do it so your Father in heaven sees. Um, what about when you read in Matthew 21, 12? Keep in mind, Peter was a witness of these things. And Jesus entered the temple and he drove out all that sold and bought in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Now this is in the temple. Why does Jesus drive them out of the temple? What were they doing with the good news? Yeah, they were making merchandise of it. You see, if you made the house of God a place that should be a house of prayer, you made it a den of thieves. But that has never happened since then, right? Does that still happen? Well, we know it happened during the Dark Ages. Susan said indulgences. Certainly, that's what, that's what really was the trigger for the Reformation is that a um, priest named Tetzel went through Germany and he was selling basically a licenses for forgiveness for money. You could buy your salvation and buy your way out of purgatory if you had enough money. And there are some that argue that in North America the legal systems become corrupt, that if you have enough money to buy good lawyers, you get a much better defense, more likely you'll be found innocent than a poor person. And I think some have shown that statistically. Um, but uh, do we also see in the religious world people selling salvation? You ever flipped through the channels and seen a televangelist? Not this one. <laughs> that were saying, uh, and they're wearing the, you know, the gold Rolex and the the gaudy clothes and the gaudy stage and they're saying that um, if you'd send in your seed faith God is going to bless you and if you just have enough faith you will be healthy, wealthy and wise and the way that you prove you've got faith you just write out a check and mail it to this address. Any of you run into that before? Yeah. And it's, uh, I, I guess the generic term for it is they call it prosperity preaching but they're making merchandise of the gospel. Um, I've also heard it called uh, blab it and grab it preaching. <laughs> and uh, you know they call it claim it theology. Um, but it's basically what they're doing is they are, they are making merchandise. They're turning the house of God into a den of thieves. It's all about money. And you can't sell the gospel. How many of you remember, matter of fact I want you to read that one. Go ahead read your verse next Alberto because that's what I want to talk about. Acts 3, 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You remember when Peter goes to the golden gate, and this is Acts chapter 3, and there's this man who's begging there, and you read the whole story from the book Desire of Ages, and he had been brought to Jerusalem hoping that Jesus would heal him he had come from a long distance. By the time he got there though, he found out that the one he had been hoping for had been executed. And so he thought all of his hope was gone. So he's at the Golden Gate. Some people had pity on him and they would carry him to the Golden Gate and he'd sit there and he'd beg. And he sees Peter and John going into the temple and um, they pause and look at him and he's thinking, oh, all the, you know, half the battle is if you can get their attention when you're panhandling, just talk to them. Tell them what your needs are. You'll, you know, if you get the sympathy enough where they'll slow down, uh, then, then you, you've got a chance. So when Peter and John look at him, he thinks, okay, I've got a chance here. And then Peter realizes he misunderstands why we're stopping and looking at him. He's thinking we're going to give him some spare change. I used to panhandle, and that's what we'd say. Would you have any spare change? And... Uh, 
And a little tip, if you want to do well panhandling, get a puppy. <laughs> because I found that if I said, could you please help, I have no food for my puppy. People often cared a lot more about the puppy than the person. It's true. And so we had a puppy when I lived on the streets that we'd pass around. <laughs> One person would panhandle with a puppy and say, can I borrow the puppy? <laughs> the other person panhandled with the puppy. But uh, so he's expecting spare change. But why is he begging? Is he begging because he's poor? Is he begging because he's crippled? So is his problem a lack of money or is a problem his crippled limbs? And so when Peter stops, he's interested in getting to the heart of the real problem. It's not just today's problem. It's a problem that's going to bother him for a long time. So often when we pray, we ask for just our immediate needs instead of what the real need is. And Peter sees he misunderstands. He says, silver and gold I don't have. Now what do you think, looked, what do you think his expression looked like when he said that? <laughs> oh, yeah. And what, what if Peter had said, look, but I'm going to preach to you. I've stopped before at where I saw people were panhandling. I didn't really. Sometimes all I had was a credit card, and I've seen, but I had a track. Or, you know, I, I, um, I picked up a hitchhiker or something like that, and I said, here, I got something for you. They got all excited and said, give me this book, and they looked disappointed. <laughs> oh, what a book. <laughs> I've got something for you. And so the last thing that, you know, he's expecting is a, a, a track, but... He said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Now, did it work? Was it just because Peter said it, or did that man have faith? He had faith. And he got up, and he not only walked, he walked, and he jumped, and he leapt, and he was shouting, and he went into the temple, and he was praising God. He was so excited. It created such a ruckus that it drew a big crowd, and eventually Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin as though they had committed a criminal act because they had healed this man in Jesus' name. But anyway, so when Peter says, you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, he's saying the power of the gospel is worth much more than that. Look in Acts 8, um, chapter 18. Acts 8, 8, no, sorry, Acts chapter 8, verse 18. This is another familiar story, and I don't want to overdwell on this, but it, it is worthy of our mention and when Simon, you remember Simon is this sorcerer who's been converted, at least ostensibly he's been converted by the preaching of Peter and maybe Philip. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money saying, give me this power also. Then on anyone who I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, because when he operated as a magician and a sorcerer before, he always said, look, I can sell this to you. I, you can make a profit on this. That's how he got his income. It was not uncommon in Bible times for you to pay, especially among the pagans, if you wanted some miracle or if you wanted some prayer from the priest, you made an offering. When Naaman went to Elisha to be healed, what did he bring with him? A bag of money, silver, gold, and clothes. Well, I think it was mostly silver and clothes, but he brought a lot of money to pay for it. it was, and Elisha said, how much would he take? None. I thought it was pretty. That took a lot of self-control because he bought about $50 million to pay for his healing by today's standards. I mean, not that much. It was a lot of money. And, uh, uh, but he wouldn't take anything because it was a symbol of salvation which is free. And so Simon, he's, you know, a Samaritan and uh, he thinks that, oh, yeah, this is great power. He says, here, I'll give you money. This is, you know, how it's a little honorarium that I'll pay you in order to get this power so that I can lay my hands on people too, and they'll give me offerings to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, what was Peter's reaction? Did he just gently tell him, no, no let me explain this to you, or did he come out pretty strongly? Uh, he says in pretty plain terms, Peter said to him, I'm in verse 20, your money perish with you. Now, some versions translate that in a very strong way. Because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. How much money will you give for the life of Christ? Can it be bought with silver and gold? No. Colossians 
It says, He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of His Son, of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood for the forgiveness of sins. And so um, our Jesus, our sacrifice, it's through His blood that we have forgiveness. Christ is our substitute. And you know, when somebody, if they, if they give your, their child, you can't really put a monetary amount on that. And um, this is what Peter was talking about. All right, and then the next section he talks about the passion of Jesus. And we've got a couple of verses here. Someone is going to look up for me in just a moment. Acts 10, 39. Okay, well, first I'd like to read 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin. I want to just stop there. There are a couple of very important points Peter is making. One is their suffering in the Christian life. I remember um, visiting with a brother who was uh, a believer and involved in ministry, had a traveling ministry, and um, his wife got Alzheimer's, and it was years of him caring for her under very difficult circumstances. Um, it basically took all of his time. And then on top of that, he got cancer, and then he had some kind of skin disease, uh, a type of very aggravated hives or psoriasis, so he was, poor guy was suffering. And uh, just the terrible struggles. And I remember talking to him and he said, you know, uh, I read in the Bible that Christ suffered and it's a privilege for us to suffer with him. And he said, it is through much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. And that it is very few of us will get to the kingdom without tasting some suffering. We'll never suffer like Jesus did. But he said, you know, what did Job say when he began to suffer? And his wife said, curse God and die. How did Job respond? He said, you're speaking like one of the foolish women. Shall we not receive good from the hand of the Lord and evil also? And the word evil means that trials will come. And he said, you can't just praise God when everything is good. You need to praise God even when you're going through trials. We are the best witnesses when we can praise God through our trials. It's really easy to praise God when everything's going fine, but when you can praise God, when you're going through a trial. And that, that really, see, I never forgot what that brother told me. I'm not going to tell you his name because many of you would recognize his name. Um, but I never forgot what he said because I personally knew him. I knew how much he was struggling at home, physically. Uh, he ultimately died from his, his illness. But he never complained. And I thought, wow, if I was going through what he went through, I wonder if I could have the same positive attitude. And here Peter is trying to encourage the believers. He says, remember, you were called to this because Christ suffered for us. Now, how many of you believe that we have been called to suffer? Christ said, whoever would come after me, let him take up his what? His vibrating lounge chair? <laughs> no, what is a cross? Is a cross comfortable? <laughs> a cross involves self-denial. And, you know, typically, I, I don't want you to think that when Peter talks about suffering, I think we addressed this before, that we're always talking about some kind of physical agony or some kind of sickness. Um, the way that a lot of us suffer is just the trials of life, the fight against evil. There's a battle. Most of Jesus' life, the trials that he suffered, I mean, you think about the cross, the cross was a few hours at the end. Uh, six hours out of 33 years. But most of the sufferings of Christ's life was the constant battle with the devil. And that's when you decide to follow Jesus, you invite the, the wrath of the prince of this world. All right, enough about that. I don't want to discourage you. Isn't this a terrible marketing program? Come follow Jesus and suffer. You know what a lot of pastors are doing? They're trying to change the gospel and say, come follow Jesus, you'll be healthy, you'll be wealthy, you'll be wise, you'll be blessed, you'll be happy, and there is some of that. It is, the gospel is good news. But 
they, they try to make, you know, they, they put out surveys and they find out what does the community want. And they say, well, the community, they don't want to dress up when they come to church. They say, oh, don't dress up. And the community, you know, they'd come to church, but they don't have time to get a breakfast. You come, we'll give you donuts and coffee. And they said, they come to church, but sometimes it's boring. We will entertain you. And they said, well, you know, we like to come, but... And, and so what they're doing in a lot of the churches is they're basically trying to just make the church make everybody happy. And so they're... But is that the gospel? And so it's amazing that Christ said, take up your cross and follow me. And, and a marketing specialist would have looked at his program and said, that's never going to fly. So why was it so successful? Because he said, I love you and I'm going to give you eternal life and uh, you will have ultimate satisfaction because you'll love God and you'll love your neighbor. And he really got to the core need of every human soul. It wasn't the superficial business that a lot of churches are doing today to try and get a group together. You know, we could greatly increase our attendance here. Bring donuts, turn up the volume, show videos, and give everybody that comes $100 every day that they come, and we could increase attendance. Do you know it's a fact that you always have a better attendance when there's a church potluck? <laughs> there are still some who come for the loaves and the fish. <laughs> I hope I didn't offend anybody <laughs> by saying that. All right, moving right along here. Oh, let me keep reading. Further to this you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin. That's another very important point. If you've ever wondered, was Christ sinless? Peter's pretty clear here, wasn't he? Nor was there deceit in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. Now Peter is saying this is an example of how we should act. When he suffered... He did not threaten, he didn't retaliate, but he committed to him who judges righteously. He who himself bore in his own body our sins in his own body on the tree. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. This is talking about the passion of Christ. So can you comprehend that? All right, let's just see here. Imagine that you had to suffer for another person. Um, we could probably imagine a scenario where you'd done something wrong and another person says, I'll take your punishment, and so they take your 10 lashes or your five months in jail or whatever it is. Suffering for two people, well, that'd be pretty hard. Suffering for 100, that's hard for us to comprehend. Suffering for a million people, our minds can't really wrap around that. Suffering for a billion people. <laughs> now we're just kind of out there in, how do you concentrate all of the suffering that might be deserved by a billion rebels and say, I will take all that pain in my body on the cross? We can't comprehend that. But the only way a person could do that is... Um, they'd have to suffer like only a God could suffer. And so Jesus, he didn't just suffer like a man on the cross, he suffered like God became a man on the cross, who bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, now Paul talks about that, might live for righteousness. Now, in case there are some, some listening who believe the new theology that Jesus didn't save us from our sin. He just kind of gives us a license of forgiveness so we can continue in sin. Peter's pretty clear. He took our sins in his own body so that we who are now dead to sin, uh, Paul says in Romans 6, he that is dead um, is free. If we're dead to sin, uh, we're free from it. He wants us to live as though we are dead to sin, who walk not after the flesh, but after righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Probably one of the most powerful passages in the Bible that outlines the passion of Christ is actually in the Old Testament. And if you look in Isaiah chapter 53, 
You know, we've just started recording this week a new DVD. And we've got a whole section in the DVD about this. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he will grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. And here's where it begins. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did esteem him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. Now didn't Peter just refer to that? Through whose stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. There's the gospel. We've all turned astray, and the Lord put all of our iniquity on him. That ought to touch your heart, and out of love for him, impress within you a desire to follow him. Well, I, I'm not going to read all of that, because we won't have time. Uh, let me see here. I think someone's going to read for us a verse in, what was it? Acts 10.39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Now, I want you to notice something else about this. Peter especially loves the term hanged on a tree. You notice that we just read that here, that uh, you go to Acts 5.30, for the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, who you hanged on a tree. And, um, yeah, I think we, there's another place yeah, there's at least three places where Peter says that. Any of you ever done a Bible study with Jehovah Witnesses? Um, if you live in a suburb, I'm sure they've been at your door. Uh, one of the points that they feel very strongly about is Jesus did not die on a cross. And they make a big argument that Jesus died on a torture stake. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the point is of arguing that because how would that change the plan of salvation to say that you died with your hands like this as opposed to over your head. They can make an argument that there were occasions that the Romans die, uh, crucified people on a stake, uh, but um, there's also plenty of evidence both in ancient art and archaeology that they were crucified on either a T or the traditional cross. Uh, that doesn't matter. We believe Jesus, it was a traditional cross because they nailed something above his head. And Christ said to Peter, when you're young, you gird yourself and you go where you want. And this is John 20, 21. But when you're old, another will gird you and you will stretch forth your hands. Now you might stretch forth your hands like that and you might stretch forth your hands like that, but you would not stretch forth your hands up. And so we believe Peter and Jesus, they were crucified. But they make a big deal about that. But it is true that Jesus died, it says, on a tree. Why does Peter keep emphasizing the tree? Three times at least that I know of, he says he died on a tree. If you look in Deuteronomy, and we're still talking about the passion of Christ. Deuteronomy 21, and you look in, ver I'm sorry, chapter 21, verse 22 and 23. Moses is going through the laws. If a man has committed sin deserving death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, evidently they believed in capital punishment back then, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Now you realize that that is quoted by Paul in Galatians and referenced by Peter. Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You see the connection here? So why is Peter emphasizing Jesus died on the tree? He wants to make sure that people make a connection that he took the curse for us. This is what Paul is emphasizing here. And you know, I always, it's just a little personal thing. Often you see 
in the front of these churches. They, they'll have a cross, and the cross is usually very nice, you know, planed six by six or eight by eight lumber. The Romans never used quality material like that. You know how hard it was to mill lumber back then? They had to saw it by hand. They did have sawn boards, but it was a la very labor intensive for them to saw a board. They did not use that on their criminals. When they crucified people, they just cut down a tree. They made an intersection in the tree. There might still be bark on it. And they strapped it together, and then they hung people on it. Josephus talks about when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. He said, you couldn't find a tree anywhere around the city because they had crucified so many of the Jews that rebelled. They deforested the area around Judah. They did not mill all of that lumber. So Jesus died on a pretty crude piece of tree. Another reason I emphasize that is how was it that Zacchaeus saw Jesus? Climbed a tree. How do we see Jesus? We take up our cross. We climb a tree and we will see Christ. And so I've got my own tree theology I just wanted you to know about. The resurrection of Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father. This is 1 Peter 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to the abundant mercy has begotten us again in the living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. He talks about this living hope. And he's often emphasizing, you know, this is reason to be encouraged because we have a living God. Again, 1 Peter 1.21. And through him... Who, uh, th uh, and through him believe in God who raised him up from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. How certain was Peter that Jesus lived after the crucifixion? Did he, what evidence, what more evidence could Peter have asked for that Jesus was alive? First of all, he knows he was dead. He was at the cross. He was at the tomb. He came to the tomb when it was empty. He saw Jesus personally. He ate with him by the sea. He ate with him in the upper room. He knew Jesus was alive. He had conversations with him. He was with him while others were talking with him. I mean, what evidence could you ask for that's more? Christ saying, I'm telling you, he died and he rose again. Someone's going to read for me Acts 10.40. Just a moment. I'm going to read Acts 2.23. And this is, of course, Peter's Pentecost sermon. And he said, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And Peter's referring to the statement of David you will not leave your holy one in the tomb to suffer corruption. All right, go ahead, please read uh, Acts 10.40. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly not to all the people but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Yeah, they just, it's pretty clear. A matter of fact, if you look in Acts chapter 10, verse 37, uh, you can just see all through the writings of Peter, and you know, you find a number of Peter's sermons are in the book of Acts. You don't really have Peter preaching other than that. You have him talking a lot, but he's not really preaching until you get to Acts and you get to his books. Um, you look in Acts chapter 10, 37. That word which you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judah and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Now, Peter says that word which you know. Who is he talking to in Acts chapter 10? A Jew or a Gentile? Cornelius? Acts chapter 10? He's talking to a Gentile. And he said, you know. That word you know. It was such common knowledge that uh, what had happened with Christ, it was the headlines. Everybody knew about it. How many of you heard that Donald Trump was elected? Now, do you think that's a silly question? In our culture, wouldn't you think that would be a silly response if someone said, what? Really? Um, that's not, not a political question. I'm just using the illustration here, you realize. <laughs> I'm just saying it's just common knowledge. And so Peter could even say to a Roman, you know what happened which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Now what does the word Messiah mean? The anointed. 
God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. He's the Messiah, the Christ, with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. And God was with him. And we are witnesses of these things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed, here he goes again, by hanging on a tree. And I told you, he, he likes that phrase. All right. Um, Let's go ahead and look in, uh, we're looking about Jesus the Messiah. And of course, we just talked about that one in Acts chapter 10. Psalm 2, verse 2 and 3. The kings of the earth have set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us, taking war against the anointed. And this is what the nations had done. You go to Psalm 1850. Great deliverance he gives to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. Now, this is a statement that's a, basically a dual prophecy about David and, um, and Jesus. And then you can look in Daniel 9, 25. Therefore know and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. It's a prophecy again about the anointed. And so they were all looking for the Messiah to come. And, um, and I look at the clock and see I'm out of time. Let me just close with this. Two verses, real quick. Peter says here, Nor is there salvation, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other na name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Can we be saved through Buddha? Can we be saved through Muhammad? Or Krishna? Or any other religious leader? There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. It is only through his name. Acts 10, 43, Paul, uh, Peter says, To him all of the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive remission of sin. Isn't that good news? Whoever believes through his name, we can receive forgiveness of sins. Well, I'm, I'm enjoying studying the book of Peter. I want to remind those that if you missed it at the beginning, we do have a free offer for today. It's called The High Cost of the Cross. It's free. The number to call is 866-788-3966. Ask for The High Cost of the Cross. God bless you. We'll study his word together again next week. Friends, one of the amazing things that you'll often find in the South Pacific Islands, like here on Fiji, is the vivai vai plant. Now in North America, if you want to build a fence, you've got to get fence posts, and then you put the wooden fence posts in the ground, and then after a few years, they're going to rot and break off, unless they're specially treated. But here, they've got these trees, the vivai vai tree. They can cut them right out of the woods. They'll take a stick, they stick it in the ground, and because they have so much rain and precipitation, it begins to sprout and turns into a living fence post. It makes up its mind that it's gonna flourish wherever you stick it, which is a good lesson for you and me. So you might wonder sometimes if you've got a purpose in life. You might feel like you're growing sort of sporadically in every direction. And then along comes this person who cuts you down and carries you off. He sticks you in the ground, but you look back and you say, there was a plan, there was a purpose. God knows how to teach us how to prosper where he plants us. You might wonder why the Lord has put you where he has in life, but you can put down roots and you can grow and you can serve a great purpose for God. You know, it's like God says in Jeremiah chapter 29, I know the plans that I've got for you to give you a future. God has a purpose for your life, friends, and he can help you to prosper and grow wherever you're planted.